Yeah, so Mark's here, yeah, so and I saw Meredith come in. Yep, there's Meredith. We have everybody here. So, Rob, do you want to do the introductions, or how do you want to go? No, you know, if, you could, if you could just do the local thing there, so that there's not kind of a... I'm facing Tim, and right. I don't know how easy I am to hear. All right, so welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. So punctual. So it's our pleasure today to have Tim. He's, he's going to be basically presenting his PhD thesis. So the way this thing is going to work is I think he has about between 40 minutes and an hour to present his slides and then it's going to be the time for the audience or the general public to ask questions that you might have that you, it's not clear. So please ask as much as you want. Don't feel uh, concerned in the sense that we will not take against him uh, whether you ask him questions or not. It's good that you take the chance that he's presenting in front of you to clarify what he has been working for the past four years or five. Um, you know, you've been supporting him as family friends, so maybe it's also good that you actually get a full understanding of what he has been spending his time on. So feel comfortable to ask as many questions as needed, and then we'll kindly ask you to leave the room such that the, um, basically the professors can further question team and have a nice discussion with him. And with that being said, so we have on the computer basically Rob, Eric, and Walt, and Walt uh, who have been basically, I would say, uh, advising in a more closely manner uh, team through his years here. And it's just that unfortunately they are overseas or other, other places in the world, but they're being uh, kindly to adjust the different schedules so that we can all be at the same time meeting together. So with that, without further delay, please, Tim, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So welcome, everyone. I uh, want to recognize Mark and Meredith on my committee uh, here this morning. And then, uh, like Mark said, we've got Eric Pardiak, and he's in France, so he's staying late. And then we've got uh, Walt Mahaffey uh, in Oregon, so he's up early. And same with uh, Rob, he's in Vancouver. So that's my graduate committee, so thank you all for coming. Um, and we're also uh, live streaming for some family uh, in the Midwest. So welcome to them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we're happy, happy to be here, happy to present this, this work. So my name is Tim Price, and uh, today I'm presenting my work on an experimental study of momentum and scalar transport in, uh, in heterogeneous vegetative canopies. So there's a lot of definitions there, and we'll, we'll define those uh, coming soon. So the outline of how this presentation will go is, uh, first I'll start with an introduction to canopy flows define some terms with canopies uh, and narrow down what, uh, what it is we're looking at um, and the impact of it. Uh, from there, I'll introduce the, uh, the four research areas um, that are presented in my dissertation. Uh, first is a, a wind tunnel study of particle deposition um, onto leaves uh, enhanced by turbulence. Uh, second is a field experiment on a full uh, mature uh, windbreak, vegetative windbreak in southern Idaho. Uh, this is a novel experiment with turbulence and particle dispersion. Uh, third is a uh, detailed series of wind tunnel experiments using stereoscopic imaging and optical technique to measure the flow inside of heterogeneous uh, canopies. And finally, an a priori uh, evaluation, uh, an LES a priori evaluation using that wind tunnel data set to determine appropriate modeling methods um, in sparse organized canopies. And then we'll wrap it up with conclusions and impact and, uh, like Mark said, uh, uh, questions or anything. I wonder if I need to mute somebody over here. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, that's okay. So, uh, first off, an introduction uh, to canopies. So we're talking about vegetative canopies. There's all, all varieties of canopies. You have uh, crops, you have dense forests, uh, desert uh, areas, um, and why do why does canopy flow matter? Why does anybody care about how the wind blows through a branch? Um, and that's simply put that the exchange of energy from the surface to the atmosphere, driving the weather, things like that, 
um, often happens through a vegetative canopy. So it's a complication to what would otherwise be a pretty straightforward problem. Uh, the canopy can drive turbulence that, it, that enhances exchange. Um, plants can evapotranspirate and cause moisture exchange to the atmosphere, which is modulated by turbulence. Um, and the, uh, the particles, you know, mold spores, pollens, uh, other chemical agents are changed in the canopy. So the canopy modifies the flow. And so if you want to understand the transport of these things, the energy from, to and from the surface, uh, particle releases, uh, evapotranspiration, uh, evaporation, you need to quantify the turbulence and the momentum exchange inside of a canopy. So it's a, it's a critical piece to a much, much bigger uh, project. So let me do three canopies here. The first one is uh, probably one you're most familiar with. This would be dense homogeneous canopies. So this is characterized by homogeneity, both in, in, in multiple directions. You think of a stand of trees, a, uh, a field of corn. You don't know where you're at, you know, but the, the nature of the canopy is consistent. So you, this, this aids in a lot of simplifications. You can condense it down to a profile that's if it's fully developed, you can have a profile of velocity that's consistent um, and representative of the whole field. So that's the horizontal homogeneity uh, approximation. Uh, individual elements aren't important. So if you're going to model this, you don't need to model every tree. You can just put a term in there, like a drag term, and say, this is representative. And it works really well. Um, and then after, after any entrance regions, you know, like a, a forest clearing into a forest, there's a transition, but then it becomes fully developed flow. And these, these assumptions work really well. Finally, would be uh, secondarily, it would be something like a windbreak canopy. So this is an abrupt discontinuity in the surface. So this is, you know, this picture here is actually of the Raft River windbreak experiment, which I'll be pre presenting shortly. You can see we've got grassland, and then we've got a, a dense stand of juniper trees forming a windbreak. There's not really a fully developed nature of this flow. The windbreak modifies the flow. And then in the wake of the windbreak, the flow renormalizes back to what it was before. Um, and finally, is sparse canopies. And this is kind of the, the core of what, uh, what we do and what I've been doing. This is a mixture of dense homogeneous canopies. So if you're in a grape vineyard, for instance, and you look around, there's some homogeneity to it. Uh, you know, the rows go off into the distance, but the rows are also spaced considerably apart. You know, sometimes two times the height of the row, and that that introduces heterogeneity. So it's it has some attributes of a dense homogeneous canopy, but also has some attributes of windbreaks, and but it's distinct because it's many windbreaks kind of superimposed. Individual elements are important. Um, there's there may or may not be a steady state uh, flow, so the horizontal homogeneity assumptions may or may not be valid. It's also received considerably less attention in the research literature. Uh, but it applies to uh, many types of trellis canopies in agriculture, you know, grape vineyards, uh, early hops, things like that, that uh, some orchards will have these characteristics. So uh, this, is a, this is an overview of the three core experiments that I performed. Um, like I said, this is primarily an experimental uh, dissertation. So the first one there is a, is a wind tunnel experiment, look quantifying particle deposition onto leaf elements. And we'll discuss that in great detail. Second is a full-scale windbreak experiment in the field in southern Oregon in the Raft River Valley. And third is a stereoscopic particle image velocimetry wind tunnel data set that was performed here at the University of Utah in the high-speed wind tunnel. So we'll go through each of these in detail. We'll give background on the individual areas and then uh, dive into the results and contributions and, uh, and go from there. So first, let's talk about particle deposition. So there's lots of processes uh, that govern particle deposition. So we're thinking small here. We're thinking element size, we're thinking single particle type models. So what happens if you have some dust or some mold spores blowing in the wind. There's some options for dry deposition. The, uh, the particle 
may not deposit, just scoots around, uh, doesn't deposit, and off it goes to the next vegetative element or obstacle, or goes aloft in the atmosphere and settles otherwise. Second is sedimentation. This is like gravitational settling. If a particle's heavy or large, it's going to have some mass and, uh, and want to you know, have a gravitational settling effect. So you see this a lot with, uh, with coarse uh, road dust and things like that. Interception is when a particle uh, gets very close to the leaf and is intercepted uh, by virtue of just the radius overlap. You know, it's, it's uh, brought into the, bound, the turbulent boundary layer of the, of the leaf and is deposited via interception. And finally, inertial impaction. This is when a particle has inertia and can't, uh, with the streamline, streamlines and everything, can't move out of the way. And it's just, it's, it's destined for an impact and deposits onto the leaf. This is the, this is the one that I focus on is inertial impaction. And it's covered by the Stokes number, which is essentially a time ratio, a time uh, constant of getting out of the way versus time constant of the inertia of the particle. So this can be modulated. You see in there, there's the diameter of particle squared, the density of the particle, a uh, correction factor, the velocity of the stream, the viscosity of the fluid, and finally, a characteristic length scale. So if the Stokes number is high, you know, large particle, large density, small length scale, uh, that particle is not able to move out of the way. Vice versa, if you've got a small particle with a small density and a large length scale, say an entire broad leaf, there's a lot of time for that very light and small particle to move out of the way. And so that's the fundamental uh, basis of the Stokes number inertial impaction. So current, uh, there's models built up to uh, model and predict inertial impaction. And, uh, and they're in use in, uh, in various models. Uh, they're used anywhere from air quality models to industrial filtration um, systems and, and building up better air filters, things like that. Uh, the ones for inertial impaction are based on laminar flow experiments. So the, the flow, when they derived these experiments, uh, was in the laminar state. There wasn't any turbulence. And so that's why you see only the velocity, just a bulk mean velocity. Uh, field studies uh, done by Brandt uh, and, uh, and others have shown that there's chronic, um, that there's chronic <coughs> underprediction in these models that real-world field experiments show much higher deposition rates than these models would otherwise predict. And uh, Sean Moran, many of you uh, remember him, uh, did some detailed wind tunnel experiments quantifying the effect of isotropic turbulence on particle deposition. The figure borrowed from, from his paper, and his hypothesis was that turbulent eddies of a certain length scale would enhance particle deposition onto non-impaction surfaces. And so, You've got, he used plastic plates. If you have a plastic plate and you have a particle coming in, uh, he, his hypothesis was turbulent eddies would wrap around and you'd get deposition on all surfaces. And this was, uh, this was experimentally validated. And he came up with a new Stokes number. This is a Stokes star, which is scaled by the Taylor microscale Reynolds number. So this is a Reynolds number of the Taylor microscale effects. Uh, using the fluctuating velocity Taylor microscale and the viscosity to form the Reynolds number. And then he came up with this parameterization here where the deposition fraction, this is the percentage of particles that deposit, uh, was a function of this modified Stokes number. So the research question at hand is can this be generalized and applied beyond uh, idealized substrates? Is this kind of a, a very narrow finding or can it be applied broadly? Um, and what needs to happen to this parameterization to apply it broadly. And uh, so we formulated a series of wind tunnel experiments similar in structure to the original Moran experiments. And then we put a substrate in the wind tunnel and, uh, and applied uh, fluorescent microparticles, which we'll talk about in a minute. It contains three sub-experiments. So there's three distinct experiments in this one experiment. Uh, we have to generate the aerosol. Uh, generate the aerosol and characterize the aerosol because the size of the particle matters in the Stokes number. We need to generate the turbulence and quantify the turbulence. 
because the turbulence is in the Stokes star formulation. And then finally, we need to quantify somehow how the particles deposited, what depth position fraction was there. And uh, so there's three, uh, three separate experiments in this. Here's a schematic view of the tunnel. So we put in a leaf or a branch or twig, and then we inject with fluorescent microparticles through a turbulence grid that generates isotropic turbulence. Some of those particles are, uh, are deposited on a leaf. We wash the leaf in a volume of water, then take that water and uh, quantify the fluorescence of the background fluorescence of these, of these particles with fluorescein. We can quantify the, the fluorescence, do a linear regression on the, on the distillation series, and back out the mass uh, that, was, that was deposited. And this is a function of the concentration of the plume of the aerosol, which we measured, and the velocity and the turbulence and things like that. Um, so, uh, like I said, the aerosol, aerosol generation con and characterization, so we measured the, uh, the size distribution of the particles, this is microns, uh, for the three different velocities we tested, uh, 4.9, 8.3, and 9.5 meters per second. And you can see we've got a pretty nice distribution, um, and uh, we use this, this statistical distribution to apply um, onto the models. And we quantify the turbulence. And so this is the distributions of the turbulence of the velocities of the different uh, at the different speeds. So we're able to derive out the U prime for the Taylor, Taylor microscale Reynolds number. And then finally, we did deposit uh, deposition quantification, which involved measuring the area very carefully because we needed to get the mass out uh, per per area of leaf. And we also had to measure characteristic length scales. Uh, so the results show uh, continued under prediction, but it, it gets complicated. Uh, it's kind of the punchline. So we had to come up with new parameterizations. The Moran model um, that I show in the earlier slides, the Moran model only quantified uh, the front surface deposition. Even though we showed that there was off-axis deposition, the model he put forth was only the front surface and didn't actually account for the, the wraparound eddies. And so we had to come up with an idea of how to parameterize the area. So we looked closer at the Moran data and found a Reynolds number of dependence of the non-deposition phase, uh, non-deposition phase contribution of the total deposition. So we turned this from an idealized frontal impaction turbulence quantification to a whole leaf concept that the flow is going to deposit on all the surfaces and the off-axis contribution scales with the Reynolds number. Um, and so we, uh, we introduced this, this uh, area weighting function. So there's a gamma in here. So you have A frontal, which is the frontal projected area. The wetted area is the total area of the, of the object. Um, and this gamma is a weighting factor that's a function of the Reynolds number that, uh, that weights an off-axis contribution. Uh, this is shown, like if you look closely at this, you can realize this can go negative and do all sorts of weird things. Uh, it's because the Moran data had a very limited range of Reynolds number, so we don't have data to extend this to its logical extents um, at this point. But that's something that definitely needs to be done, so this is only valid in the Reynolds number that Moran tested. And then we came up with this new parameterization of the form of Moran, but has uh, different, different factors. And this is the Stokes star curve. So this is the scale Stokes number, but the uh, deposition fraction of a whole leaf. And we continue to see uh, trends. There's a lot more spread because we're dealing with real geometry here um, and kind of compounding experimental um, uh, data. But the, uh, the fit has become more universal. It can be applied to whole leaf scenarios. And the R-squared of the FITS uh, is, shows drastic improvement. The laminar impaction has an R-squared of about 0.15 on the current data set. The Moran FIT by itself achieves about 0.42, so that's a significant improvement from the laminar data. And then this new uh, model has an R-squared of about 0.65. So what did we learn? Uh, we learned, uh, first and foremost, uh, look, digging deeper in the Moran data, we found a Reynolds number dependence on the off-axis, off 
impaction face deposition and incorporated that into a, a new model. The, uh, I didn't mention this, but we used a characteristic link scale where we essentially can integrate a leaf profile or arbitrary geometry and come up with a characteristic link scale. Uh, Schwepp 1993 uh, presented this. We incorporated this to account for irregular shapes, like what's the length scale of a broadleaf? Well, Schwepp told us, and it seems to work pretty well. Uh, the, uh, we, we used the off-axis Reynolds number dependence and the, the Schwepp model to maintain and create a whole leaf deposition uh, concept that uh, it becomes more applicable, more can be more applied, more generalized, and shown that it classes the data well. And uh, finally, this has been uh, accepted and is being published shortly in atmospheric environment. So changing gears a little bit, we'll move on to the vegetative windbreak uh, field experiments. So this is a uh, this is a full scale study on windbreaks, and many others have done windbreak studies. This is kind of a it's a very clean, nice experiment to do because you you can stick an ammometer behind a windbreak or a or a fence like a snow fence and get some data. So folks have been doing this uh, way back uh, into the 60s and 70s because windbreaks are commonly used for dust control. Uh, you see them a lot. You see them in Wyoming for snowdrift control um, and soil retention, things like that. So they're they're very applied. They're useful structures. And uh, however, there's uh, there's a lack of data for profiles of turbulence in the wake, so showing how the wake evolves. There's been some wind tunnel experiments, but there's no field experiments with a progression of profiles um, in the wake, and uh, especially not co-located with dust uh, dispersion data as well. So this is a very unique experiment. Uh, nothing like this has been done. Um, here we see a schematic this is borrowed from uh, Judd 1996 and Speckert uh, 2014, which shows kind of the flow features where you have this, this shear zone coming off the top of windbreak with height h, and it penetrates down, and the, the velocity profile, so these profiles here begin to renormalize by profile f, the, the wind is renormalized to the upstream profile. So there's this wake coming off of the, uh, off of the windbreak, and this experiment uh, quantifies that. Um, and some of the research questions, we use this as an opportunity to validate QUIC, uh, which is a uh, low power uh, diagnostic flow model that has a windbreak module that Speckert and Partiac introduced. So this is a, a great uh, direct validation of that, um, and more specifically of Speckert and Partiac 2014, who presented this in great detail. So here's the site. We can see that's Derek on the tower uh, because why not? I think we had a safety tether. Um, there, was, there were injuries, but not from falling off the tower. It's from cutting a bundle of, uh, bundle of cable that had a zip tie. And Derek was anxious to cut the zip tie, those bundling the cables, and slice his hand really good. So we got a nice trip to the, uh, to the Burley, Idaho emergency room on that one. Um, and a lesson in knife safety. Uh, this is located on, actually on the BYU Skaggs Research Ranch um, in Cassia County, Idaho. Uh, it's about 12,000 acres, and BYU and the USDA and the De Idaho Department of Transportation partnered in 1994 to build this vegetative windbreak. So they were having blowing dust and snow issues on the nearby busy highways, uh, Highway 81 of Idaho and Interstate 84. Um, and this is an exceptionally dangerous stretch of highway um, in adverse weather conditions. So they had a lot of deaths, and the landowner and the agencies got together, built a windbreak. And it's a great test bed, and it happens to be a research ranch owned by BYU. So they were very accommodating to us to stick some towers and sensors all over their property and keep the cows away. So here's a schematic. We have six towers forming a traverse of the windbreak. The windbreak uh, is composed of two distinct rows of four meter tall juniper and 3.3 meter uh, uh, shrub and separated by about nine meters. So we've got a double vegetative windbreak here. It's all drip irrigated, so it's very lush. 
uh, and very nice. We used, uh, we actually created a little road uh, going right next to it and did vehicle passes back and forth to generate road dust uh, and a lot of road dust. And so these towers have both sonic anemometers, which measure the three velocity components um, and quantify the turbulence. And they're co-located with 12 dust tracks. So these are devices that measure dust concentration, essentially mass. And so with that, we can get an upstream. So tower A here is uh, upstream of the flow. It's just getting background dust and the approach flow uh, Quantities we have a tower, or we've got a tower right next to the road, so that quantifies the source strength of the dust. Uh, the truck drives by, generates a ton of dust. We've got a tower inside the gaps, and then finally in the wake we have three towers, each with sonic anemometers and dust tracks. And uh, this was also a, a quick validation study. So quick was modified with. Uh, with the models of Speckert and Pardiac uh, 2014, the windbreak module. Um, and along with that, they incorporated the, the earlier Moran deposition model uh, into, into QUIC. And this is a review of what we covered in the previous section. This strictly uh, included the Moran, uh, the Moran module. And so the methodology in the validation study is to initialize the QUIC model with the upstream conditions, you know, the, the upstream turbulence conditions and particle and source strength, and then validate that those are, are reproduced, uh, comparing against the data. So this is the uh, U velocity uh, results. So these are normalized velocities, so U over U ref, or U ref is the upstream uh, profile. And these are successive downstream profiles. So we can see uh, tower C, a very strong inflection at the, at the peak, uh, and the the dots are the are the measured results from the towers, and the smooth line are the quick profiles uh, that were generated. And so tower C looks really good. We uh, tower D, we it's one of those cases where you have strong inflection. Oh, I wish I had a sensor right there, uh, but we didn't. But the profile tends to agree uh, quite well, except our our bleed flow is considerably lower. Uh, deep inside the canopy. So this is flow going through the vegetation. Um, and uh, so it's quite low, quite a bit lower than, than Quick is anticipating. And then we begin profile renormalization. And we can start to see that in the in the profiles here. And then we have a single data point at the end uh, where Quick is uh, predicting a continued renormalization. So the relative error here is about 34% um, under prediction of Quick. Um, which is not bad. It looks terrible, but it's order of magnitude, which sometimes is really good. So this is the turbulence uh, profiles, and here Quick does uh, considerably better. So there's a peak in the turbulence intensity at the canopy height. There's a shear zone there, and uh, and Quick does uh, quite good. Oops. Uh, one thing to note is on Tower E here, it appears we may have missed the peak. That Quick is Quick is uh, predicting a, a much higher peak in the turbulence. And we have three sensors here that clearly show a peak um, that's descended uh, quite a bit deeper into the canopy than Quick is suggesting. Um, so this is, that's definitely a miss, but the, the profiles are the same, uh, the trends are the same. And finally, uh, this, is, this is the dust concentration. So this is C over C source. So this is the roadside dust uh, the source strength and the measured uh, dust concentration is co-located. And we can see Quick uh, agrees amazingly, I'll just say it, amazingly well with, with the data. Uh, Tower D is in the wake, and we're at very small concentrations, 2% to you know, 5% of the source strength data has come through. So the vegetative windbreaks are, are spectacularly good at filtering out these particles. And quick is quick is uh, is simulating that quite well. And even further downstream, Tower E, uh, the profiles, uh, the points lie on the lines, which is which is very good. So what did we learn? 
Uh, we learned that the velocity profiles um, agree quite well with early uh, wind tunnel studies that generated profiles of turbulence. Uh, the windbreak model of Speckert and Pardiak is uh, found to be uh, quite accurate. Uh, there were some misses in the velocity and the turbulence, but the trends were all there. And the particle dispersion components were, were very good. The application of the Moran model into QUIC uh, showed uh, some really good performance. And this, this draft is, uh, is not in publication, hasn't been submitted yet, but it's ready to, it's ready to go. Um, this is also a uh, contribution here is that this is a very unique data set. There's nothing like it um, in the literature. So modelers and others can use this uh, in the future for, for detailed evaluation of models and other terminal data. So it's, a, it's a, just an experimental contribution in and of itself. OK, so moving on, we're going to move into sparse canopy flows. So we've done particle deposition. We've done wind breaks. Now we're going into yet a different canopy with its own complications. So this is sparse canopy flow, where you have something like a vineyard um, or an orchard, where the rows or elements are spaced um, you know, within the order of magnitude of their height. So there's a lot of empty space in there, but there's still dense vegetation. It's just periodic. Uh, there's been PID studies of, uh, of canopy flows before. Um, this isn't novel and unique to, to do this. Uh, in fact, uh, Van Houten Zoo, um, they actually made a full-scale field PIV experiment, stuck it out in a cornfield. Uh, by all accounts, it was uh, an extraordinarily hard uh, experiment. And they had, they had a dense corn stand. And so you know, there's, that's not applicable to sparse organized canopies. But they were able to get some data um, at night under very specific conditions with a really powerful laser. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting read if, you, if you're interested in uh, kind of harebrained uh, field experiments like I am. Uh, and then there's been other experiments like uh, tree branches and wind tunnels, looking at the wakes of tree branches and quantifying those sort of things. Um, then recently there's been real interest in kind of sparse canopies with fractal geometry. So you think of like pyramids stacked up on the floor of a wind tunnel and using horizontal slices of PIV to build up a volumetric ensemble average. And so you, get, you can get some really nice simulation validation studies um, with that. Um, and then there's also been quite a bit of, uh, of attention with large eddy simulation. Uh, things like uh, Bailey and Stoll did uh, very detailed simulations. That's what this figure is here. Uh, sparse organized canopies kind of looks like a vineyard, right? We've got an understory, we've got a canopy, and uh, um, and they you know determined uh, some of the effects of, of row spacing um, in a large eddy simulation framework. So there's no, there's been no uh, one of the holes in the literature. So there's been no validation of the subgrid scale models, the specific models that the simulations use. There's been no validation in the uh, for the case of the sparse organized canopies that have distinct features that don't abide by the horizontal homogeneity. There's spatial effects there um, that that this the subgrid scale models haven't been validated against. Um, and there's currently no uh, PIV studies looking specifically at sparse organized canopies to tease out the physics of this. So PIV, particle image velocimetry, um, allows direct assessment of the canopy, specific features in a spatially organized canopy. Um, and this can, in turn, lead to better understanding of the bulk features and the turbulence in the canopy. Um, which can also lead to better models and validation for the subgrid scale models. So this is a, a spatial study of, of, a, uh, of a model canopy. So the research questions uh, that we seek to, to answer, how does spacing affect the flow? So you can have these rows that are spaced, and you'll see different spacing. Some vineyards are spaced one way, some orchards are spaced another way. How does the spacing affect? At what point do those rows become really important individual elements? Or is there a point where it can be aggregated as a, whole, as a homogeneous canopy? What's the cutoff? 
Um, there's been large eddy simulation studies done by Huang, uh, 2009. Uh, he did sparse homogeneous canopies and went really sparse, like you know the deserts of Idaho sparse, and found found breakdowns there. Uh, but his wasn't an organized canopy. But when do when do these assumptions uh, begin to apply? And then, uh, what are the canopy flow features specific to sparse organized canopy? Are there features in the flow that can be quantified um, and identified? And this picture here is a is a vertical view down in the wind tunnel. Uh, those are little wool tufts on stands. We checked uh, for various. Uh, we looked for spanwise velocity crossing the center line, like crazy things like that. And just want to make sure our data was okay. We did a lot of data validation. So this is an image. So these are uh, this is inside the wind tunnel, the high speed wind tunnel. See, we've got Lego mats on the floor. Uh, we're engineers, right? Every excuse we can to use Legos. So the entire wind tunnel floor is covered in Legos. I was a kid in the candy store, the Lego store buying all those mats. And then these are model canopy rows. And they're cut out of a clear film. And there's squares cut out in them of different sizes. And they're fastened on these Lego stands and then arrayed in this, in this pattern here. So then the cameras. Uh, I'll show you in the schematic uh, coming up here. Um, so the, yeah, like I said, the rows are cut. This was cut actually uh, for the scrapbookers among us on a silhouette cameo cutting machine, uh, which is just a pen plotter type razor blade. Um, cuts out these square features. We did two different meshes. We kept the density constant, but one of them has small squares, you know, many more small squares, and the other one has fewer large squares. But the density has been held constant um, at 25% uh, blockage ratio. This gives us a lot of flexibility. The red transparent color was really was chosen uh, for uh, for the laser access, the optical technique here. We're shining a laser down the center of the wind tunnel and then measuring uh, measuring the, the particles there in the flow and any reflections and gleams and all these things. Um, off of off of the objects completely contaminates the data. So we made these transparent red rows and then red blocked the camera. So they essentially disappeared and we had uh, extraordinarily high data quality in areas that traditional methods would have completely failed. Um, so why mesh rows? Uh, does that look like a, a great vineyard uh, row to you? Eh, you know, that can be argued, right? But this was done, this was a compromise. Uh, Ron Key, uh, 2011, quantified all these different rows. He's a researcher in the Netherlands looking at urban canopy flows. And he, he created all these different uh, canopies and showed, uh, showed some pros and cons to a 2D uh, organization. Um, we can't really go, we can't really put depth because we get way too much blockage. Um, and we would suffer from optical access and reflections and all these things. But these still simulate the drag associated with the canopy row. And that's what's really important is matching that, uh, that, that physics. So we adapted the ground key structures to PID to account for optical access uh, while maintaining the physics as best we could. So here's a schematic. So we've got... Uh, uh, actually, the cameras aren't shown. The cameras. This is the view that the camera sees, looking down the rows. And so we can see inside the rows here, uh, flow as well as flow above the canopy. The rows were spaced at uh, according to row height, so half h, half the canopy height. They were spaced 1h, 2h, and 2.6h. Um, all of the the two mesh configurations. One of them has a four millimeter square pattern. The other has a two millimeter square pattern, uh, both the 25% porosity. And then for all these experiments, the wind tunnel velocity was held constant. The pressure was balanced in the tunnel. Um, and only the row spacing uh, was varied. So a quick overview of particle image velocimetry. Uh, for those not familiar, the, the flow in the wind tunnel uh, is seeded with olive oil droplets. Uh, they're less than five micron. So this is very fine olive oil. It's great for your hair and your skin. And uh, then we illuminate the flow with a pulse laser that's synchronized 
with two, uh, with two cameras. So the, the laser is illuminating these particles in flow, kind of like when you're on your the grandma's couch under the blinds and you hit it and you see all that dust go up into the blinds. We're measuring that and coming up with the flow field is what's going on here. Um, stereoscopic PIV adds two cameras, so we actually have depth perception. We can measure an out-of-plane velocity as well. Benefits, we get a full 3D slice of velocities through the, through the canopy without putting probes into the flow. We get instantaneous full 3D fields. Um, the challenge is it's a very challenging experimental technique. Uh, it requires very detailed adjustments of the parameters, managing reflections, calibrations are a nightmare. Um, and we don't have out-of-plane gradients, uh, but that's, that's okay. So then two successive images, so you get T equals T and T equals T plus delta T of these particles, and you can do a cross-correlation and determine the most probable velocity vector for that region of particles. So we're not tracking particles in the flow. We're doing correlations in the interrogation region and determine the most probable vector. So here's the, the gory details of our setup. We have two 29 megapixel 12-bit uh, cameras. They sample really slow because they're high resolution. So we have nothing time resolved. Um, and depending on the optics, we can get really wide field of view, or we can lens up and see, you know, down to the down to the Kolmogorov scale. Uh, two 250 millijoule pulse lasers with sheet optics. So this is the laser you can see suspended above the wind tunnel. And then the data set is just a series of pictures that you can then process into vectors. Pictures about 450 gigabytes per experiment, and end up about 50 gigabytes of just raw vectors per experiment. Um, our vector pitch, so our space in between the vectors in real space, is between half a millimeter and 0.9 millimeter. So we have very fine resolution inside the canopies. The canopies are 70 millimeters tall. So we have, uh, in the vertical direction, we've got 140 vectors inside the canopy, vertically. Um, and just uh, a little bit of overview, we ran into a lot of problems, calibrations not holding, uh, reflections and scattered light, and there's a lot of engineering solutions to these problems. We fabricated all new mounting structures, uh, put mirrors and films all over the wind tunnel to control these, these errors. And then finally, we were able to adjust for the remaining di uh, disparity between the calibration plane and the laser plane by calculating a disparity vector and going back and adjusting the data. And that gets rid of persistent out-of-plane velocity problems. And then finally, there's always random errors. And there's, there's a lot of gremlins in the Insight software that does the correlation processing. And so you have to trust but verify. You have to check everything and then throw out anything that looks fishy, which we did. Um, finally, so this, this took about 20 months and over 40, uh, almost 50 runs of the wind tunnel to get high quality repeatable results. So this is an exceptional um, experimental effort that, uh, that came out with uh, very high quality data as we'll see and as we dive deeper into it. The uh, funny, uh, funny story, the preliminary data was presented to Agricultural and Forest Meteorology in 2014. It was awarded the best presentation and about four weeks later we realized the data was complete garbage, had to throw it all away. So I fooled them. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was kind of the story of it is uh, you had to throw away a lot of data, but we ended up with good quality data. It just took a long time. So here's an instantaneous sample of what the velocity fields look like. Uh, for nerds that love fluid dynamics, this is beautiful. Um, see a, a lot of vectors, we have complex streamlined functions. Uh, we don't have horizontal homogeneity here. We've got very distinct features inside the flow. This is the rows blocked off here, and this is colored by the velocity magnitude. Um, and even in the instantaneous field, you can see structures, um, little eddies and kinks and twists in the streamlines. And since we can, a little bit of an animation here. So I have, each experiment has 2,000 frames, give or take, and we have eight different experiments. So all told, I've got about an hour of vectors like this to, to watch. So we've got some time. No. <laughs> we'll just watch them. And you can just you can see the, the chaotic structure 
of the uh, of the flow. You see differences in the height of the shear zone. You see differences in the velocity magnitude inside the canopy. Uh, the, you know these lines above here generally maintain uh, consistency. So this is a boundary between the canopy sublayer and the normal boundary layer uh, inside the tunnel. So uh, we can we can take these data sets and we ensemble average everything together. So these are uh, UW streamlines, uh, uh, and the coloring is done by the vertical velocity by uh, U star of H. So we can see some very distinct uh, flow topology features inside the inside the rail. Those that have taken CFD, it starts to look like lid-driven cavity flow with with some porous walls uh, modifying it. So we've got flow aloft driving a recirculation cell inside the gaps. Uh, and this recirculation cell is centered inside the gap, but pushed, uh, pushed to the right. Um, and the location and strength of this is a strong function of the row spacing. So this one uh, on the left is we've got half H, so these are very tight rows spaced together. And on the right, we have 2.6 H. So this is the most spread out we can get with our field of view at this time. And we can see modulation in the strength of the cell. So in you know, this is a very disconnected standing cell here, whereas in the 2.6H, we've got a very strong updraft. There's a lot more interaction with the flow above the canopy. Uh, and, uh, and those hold across the length scale. So the top row is the 2 millimeter mesh. The bottom row is the 4 millimeter mesh. And strictly speaking, we're not seeing a lot of difference, um, which, uh, which is good and bad. Like, it's kind of a null result. But it also shows that the flow is repeatable across many, many experiments. So it's a self-validation type thing. Um, other PID canopy studies, I'll, I'll note this out in the literature, um, don't see standing mean features like this. Um, you know, imagine a cornfield. You just have attenuation of, of the flow velocity. This is specific to sparse organized canopies where the rows are modifying the flow. Um, a little bit of introduction here. So this is sweep and ejection ratios. So sweeps and ejections are flow events that are characterized by either uh, low momentum fluid going into the canopy, or high momentum fluid going into the canopy, or low momentum fluid coming out of the canopy. So these are kind of two different uh, flow structures. Um, and we see some very strong spatial heterogeneity. So other studies have shown um, streamwise average profiles of the sweeping ejection ratios um, inside the canopy. And we can see here, we can even, even in the H14 case, there's a quiet region. We can actually start to see the individual wakes coming off of the off mesh rows, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, quiet region where uh, sweeps are dominating. Um, and then in the shear zone, this is about this is coming off the top of the row. We can see ejections dominating, and that ejections occur uh, deeper inside the canopy as you go downwind. And this is a conditional averaging. So conditional averaging is a is a mathematical technique where you can look what you're you know find what you're looking for essentially. You can set parameters and find uh, cases that match that. So for instance, we looked at exceptional stress events, so high turbulence at the top of the canopy, at H, along the line, um, at H. This is the perturbation vector field, which has been reported by Finnegan. Uh, Brian Bailey also reported these from his simulation studies. Um, so the vectors are V prime, W prime. And this is triggered off of six sigma stress events. So if you've got a probability distribution function, uh, these are way in the tails. These are extraordinarily high stress events. And this is from Bailey, uh, 2013, um, and he shows some very, very similar structures. He has a sparse understory, so there's some differences in the canopy. Uh, but we have experimental, uh, experimental evidence now of you know slightly different, but the trends are similar um, in the perturbation vector field. And we can do the same thing for sweeps and ejections. So we can identify, uh, first off, identify what are sweeps and what are ejections and then find the extreme versions of each of those. So we find six sigma 
sweeps, six sigma ejections, and then we can ensemble average those velocity fields um, and get a characteristic look at what these structures look like. Um, and so from the 2,000 frames, you know, we'll get 100 extreme ejections. Um, so that's the type of boiling down that we're doing here. And on the left, I apologize for not being uh, all that clear. Uh, on the left, these are exceptional sweep events, and on the right are exceptional Six Sigma ejection events. So the sweep events are characterized by a very inside the canopy, while they and very little interaction with the flow above the canopy. And this is an inside the canopy phenomenon. And then the ejections are characterized by very strong uplift, updrafts out of the canopy and into the mean flow. Uh, this is a unique contribution in quantifying the characteristic uh, shape and, and and structure of these events and its contribution to the to the momentum transport. Um, and we can see some effect of the row spacing. So this is half h, one, two, and two point six, in that the ejections are uh, very much stronger in the sparse case where there's much more interaction and the shear is able to penetrate uh, deeper into the canopy. Um, and then TKE profiles. Um, these are the TKE elements um, here. I won't go into, into deriving and describing the, uh, the terms. One special term here is the turbulent transport term. And this can only be quantified with, with spatial measurements. And we see some very strong dependence inside the canopy of the turbulent transport. And that's not been measured before. Um, and that's a very uh, unique signature. The others agree quite well with homogeneous canopy literature, Kamal and Finnegan, and others. Um, but the turbulent transport term uh, has some very, very distinct features. And then total dissipation there in, in slide D, in plot D, uh, has, uh, also has some canopy dependence uh, as well. And that was done with the second order streamlined structure function. So what did we learn? We learned that the, that the mean flow uh, is characterized by intermittent recirculation cells and, and standing structures inside the rows. Um, Ejection do dominates at the canopy top while sweeps dominate inside the canopy, but it's not horizontally homogeneous. It's not, streamwise average doesn't account for the intricacies of that. Um, and momentum is transferred uh, more effectively deeper inside the canopy uh, with increasing row spacing. Um, like I said, sweeping ejection ratio is not spatially constant. Uh, Turbulent transport shows sensitivity uh, to the row spacing. Uh, and finally, that the method uh, can be used successfully inside the wind tunnel uh, using stereoscopic PIV in a, in a very complicated flow that's not, uh, not well suited for PIV. Uh, the, the results have been uh, drafted and not submitted yet, but are, will be submitted to agricultural and forest meteorology. Uh, and then this, these results were presented at, like I mentioned, Ag and Forest 2014, and also boundary layers and turbulence in 2016 with very different results because we had to throw away the data from 2014. So moving, uh, finally, uh, the LES a priori study. This is recent work that myself and Greg Torkson have been working hard on. This uses that existing data set and determines exact subgrid scale stresses and, um, and the, the performance of the models. So like I mentioned earlier, LES has been used for canopy flows, but the subgrid scale models haven't been validated. Um, uh, robustly. And PAV is a great uh, source of the data for an a priori study because it has spatial flow fields that can be filtered and created uh, and simulate a filtering of something like DNS data. So there's great difficulty in measuring sufficient spatial resolution to then filter to apply a subgrid scale model. So in layman's terms, subgrid scale models attempt to uh, introduce and account for exchange between length scales between the resolved field, which is you know the points where you're doing the equations, and the and the sub-resolved field. So uh, it's attempting to transfer that energy between those those fields. So it's really hard to get data that spatially can be filtered appropriately to yield results. So this is an example of the chats data. This is a Fantastic experiment in a walnut orchard in California. Huge arrays of sonic anemometers, uh, but they can't they can't filter this for uh, spatial uh, filtering for LES. It's not a robust a priori study. 
because it relies on Taylor's hypothesis, which in a complex flow may not be appropriate. Um, and so we, we turn to the wind tunnel experiment that we did. So what are the research questions are, what are the appropriate sub scale models for sparse organized canopies? What are specific, uh, yeah, what, what are specific parameters or length scales or combination uh, that contribute to model convergence? Uh, what are the, uh, the characteristic and normal values for subgrid scale stresses uh, in sparse organized canopies? What are the appropriate averaging schemes for such an example? Uh, so basically, the procedure is we filter the raw data. Here's a kind of a progression of filtering. Uh, you have the raw data, and it's kind of like you smooth it, you smear it like you're in Photoshop to a Gaussian blur. <coughs> if you're going down. Um, and then you can reconstruct what stresses were lost. So here's some uh, some results. So this is the exact measured subfilter scale dissipation. Uh, they show some row spacing uh, dependence, but not terribly strong. The the green line is the half H, the very very tight case, which after filtering doesn't have a lot of data. So we can't put a lot of weight into that. Um, but the, the inside the canopy subfilter scale dissipation uh, approaches zero um, inside the canopy. But with some increased rates, uh, um, and this is the streamwise average Smagrinsky coefficient. So this is the exact uh, Smagrinsky coefficient that ought to be uh, recreated, I guess, for um, for a canopy uh, such as this. Uh, interesting features here. Uh, this is zero right here. So the black is the 2.6 H case. So this is the widest case. And then we go one or two H, one H, and half H. And the one H and half H have a uh, mean streamwise average and negative Smagrinsky coefficient. Um, this is indicative of backscatter in the energy cascade. This is energy going from small scales to large scales, contrary to the typical kind of Kolmogorov cascade. Um, and this this warranted uh, much further investigation because that's a little bit unusual. So we'll look at the, the spatial fields. And we can see that the 2.6H has uh, no discernible backscatter. The blue is backscatter regions. Uh, and the backscatter region is confined to the near wake of the row. Um, and conceptually, we have this idea that there is wake recombination regions where the flow is going through the row breaking up into small uh, elements and then recombining um, in that wake as it interacts with the descending shear zone. And that would indicate um, and create backscatter. The other possibility is a, a dominant uh, parameter such as the, the filtering delta over the gap width. Um, this is a study here where we varied the filter width and checked for filter width independence kind of other flow. And inside the canopy, we can see very strong filter width dependence, while above the canopy, we don't have any. Um, one note is we are capturing uh, the beginnings of the inertial subrange. The smallest filter in black here is offset from the others. So we are actually spanning into the dissipation range with our existing uh, vector pitch, which is very, very important uh, for a validation study such as this. Um, and then finally, uh, model performance. So we apply models um, onto the uh, onto the onto the field, and we see that the nonlinear model oops, in green uh, performs best. Magrinsky model is overly dissipative, which is consistent with uh, previous works. Uh, in practice, we need to figure out how to make the nonlinear model uh, behave and find out the models to associate it with and pair it with. Um, but this is likely due to the, uh, the correlation of the, of the local filter um, scale features in the nonlinear model that make it uh, perform best. Um, so overall conclusions. Um, so in this work, we've explored all sorts of scales. We've gone from micron scale particles onto individual leaves to full scale vegetative canopies, uh, uh, windbreaks with towers. We've gone into the wind tunnel to get a very detailed spatial look of the flow. Um, and we've extracted exact 
subgrid scale stresses in order to validate um, to uh, validate modeling um, efforts. Along the way, we've produced tools and methods to uh, work with these very large spatial data sets, um, experimental data sets. They're not they're not clean and pristine. They have their they have their issues. So we've developed tools and methods to to accommodate that. And then overall project uh, significant contributions. Um, so this is a summary of, of what we discussed in the contributions of each of these fields. So we have a new uh, whole leaf uh, model that incorporates new area parameterizations into turbulent enhanced particle deposition. We have a new and novel windbreak data set for turbulence and co-located dispersion, particle dispersion. We have the highest uh, resolution PID data set ever produced in a wind tunnel. Uh, according to our knowledge, it's the highest resolution one done. We were like the first with these new cameras. Um, we have spatial characterization of the flow features, the rental stress, the TKE terms within the canopy. Um, and we've conditionally averaged the, the featured and found characteristic elements of the shear stress balance. And then finally, in the operator study, we've determined exact subgrid scale stresses and coefficients uh, for several row configurations. And Hypothesis, we've developed a hypothesis of delta over row spacing is a critical scaling parameter for, uh, for row uh, resolved uh, large eddy simulation studies. So the future work is to dive deeper into, uh, into particles. Uh, we really need to quantify the effect of leaf flutter and sheltering and re-emission to kind of close the loop on uh, particle deposition studies. Uh, we need to apply the new whole leaf model into something like Quick and check and see how the improvement looks. Uh, finally, uh, it would be logical to do a high res ultra high resolution study strictly inside the canopy um, in the wind tunnel with the PIV, not looking at above the canopy and inside and compromising on the settings and resolutions. Dial in uh, very high resolution inside the canopy. And then with the methods for cutting out the rows, test various canopy configurations and, uh, and check for those uh, sort of uh, flow features. And finally, um, determine the best subgrid scale strategies uh, and methods to use in large data simulation studies. So with that, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you for your time and attention. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. All right. Okay, I have lost questions. Uh, <laughs> as, as you can cross that. Uh, yeah. First one, I just wanted to see if you could speculate for a minute. Can you repeat questions people ask? I will. I will. Yep. Yeah. Gerard had to step out, so he was uh, excusing himself. So now Nate's okay. asking a question. Because we can't always hear the person. Anyone who's not on the, on the other side of the computer, we can't hear. Right on. Uh, so I was wondering if you'd speculate for a moment on, on your wind tunnel canopies and how, I mean, you didn't explicitly state that you're trying to match my field experiments, but uh, I mean, that was kind of the idea behind these. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could speculate on those, how representative you think your uh, you know, wind tunnel canopy is of, of the things that I was doing in the vineyards in Oregon. And what attempts were made to try and match, you know, scale match or, or mm -hmm. whatever to, to, to do the stuff. Yeah, definitely. So Nate's question is, um, how does my data set compare with his field work? Um, what do we do to try and match the, the canopies and the parameterizations? Um, and so the first question is, how does it compare? It compares uh, well to a portion of your data. So everything inside the wind tunnel uh, is neutral stability. We don't have thermal effects, you know, with hot ground, uh, making updrafts and thermals and stuff, which really messes with the flow field. So this is all neutral stability. So this would be something like, uh, you know, a really breezy night in your vineyard with the wind going perpendicular to the rows. So we don't have any off axis effects like you have uh, in the field. Um, and as far as the canopy rows go, our spacing, uh, we span from half H to 2.6 H. If I'm not mistaken, I think you're about 1.8 or 2H, I think, in Oregon. That's 
Yeah, yeah, it's one and a quarter or so, I think about. Yeah, so uh, so we span the uh, the lengths uh, seen in the canopy, and finally the canopy profiles. Uh, we don't match the profile because we have a consistently fairy density. Um, where Brian has this sparse understory, the the vineyards that I experienced in Oregon on the 2013 data had a had a sparse understory um, as well. Um, did you do anything to match, to do any scale matching, Reynolds number matching, or, uh, I mean, obviously you just mentioned geometric matching. Mm -hmm. Was there anything done with tuning the drag or tuning? Yeah, or? so I don't have the, the drag values from, from your experiment, but I did calculate the drag coefficients for the, for the canopies from the tunnel. And, you know, our, you know, our drag coefficients, you know, 0.9 or so that compares really well with other laboratory field experiments, laboratory experiments of canopy drag. Um, as far as Reynolds num number scaling, uh, you know, we go as high as we can. We can't match the atmosphere as far as turbulence intensity and things like that. Uh, so we're, we're restricted in our capability to match, you know, things like canopy height to boundary layer height ratios are way off, uh, but we believe that the shear driven um, physics uh, remains applicable. So. Yeah, Arash. So, um, I'm too interested. Versus of the um, graph river mm -hmm. drain control costs, um, if you look at the, um, like the zero displacement line that you match, that is, to me, it seems like there is a shift in the uh, velocity profile from um, from what I see with the experiment. Mm -hmm. and yeah, um, that brings up a, a good. So Arash asked about um, if there was any zero displacement shifts in the velocity results from the Raptor windbreak. You know, there was some, especially one of the plots there showed essentially a, a peak off, excuse me, peak offset in the flow. Um, and I don't know the source of that, um, but we did have to kind of hack quick a little bit. Um, the quick windbreak model assumes one windbreak element. Um, this had two windbreak elements. And so we actually ran two windbreak models superimposed. So we kind of fed a windbreak profile into the second windbreak. Uh, we're not sure how that works um, as far as reality. And that's something that could certainly offset a velocity profile um, in, the, in the quick data set. So, uh, but the trends, the trends remained the same. You know that that plot that had the the pretty substantial offset. Uh, it quick was predicting a peak at about 0.9 h, and it resolved a peak at about 0.6 h. So we're only off in real space by two meters uh, on the turbulence peak. So in the grand scheme of applicability, it's not that bad. So. Um, Show this sweet thing that can mm -hmm. study canopy. In some frames, I see something like low jet effects. Is that correct to me if I'm right? Is that like um, related to the size of you know, the um, mesh that you're using, or have you ever looked at that? Um, so, are you speaking? So, Arash is asking about um, in the sweep and ejection ratio plots of the wind tunnel PIB data set. You see some features. Are you talking about near the ground, like a low-level jet? Right. The low level jet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in one of the plots, actually, if you go back, you know, 37. 37? Yeah, that one, uh, um, on the second row, the second column is left. Yeah. So H1, four millimeter? Yeah. Laser, you can okay. get right. So what are those, like, to me, it's like, um, some low jet yeah. So um, a couple a couple things. So I don't know if there's a low level jet. There really shouldn't be because the rows go all the way to the ground. Um, it also plays to the weakness of PIV in that region. So I don't put a lot of stock in the results at the wall um, of PIV. It's just not well suited for that because uh, that's where you get the worst reflections. You get the smallest particle displacements. Uh, just near wall PIV. In fact, you'll see, uh, actually, these ones I don't have masked. I usually mask up to about 10% canopy height. Um, these ones aren't. 
um, just because I don't I don't put any trust in those uh, very very close wall uh, results. Um, so I would I would bias towards that being an anomaly and not physical. Okay. And um, finally, if you look at the uh, importance of the size of those mesh. Like, um, mm -hmm. Is there any threshold for the topological features that you're seeing, or will they disappear as you get to searching? I know you you studied two of them, but mm -hmm. what is your expectation? Uh, so Rush is asking if we have different mesh. Uh, configurations like a, a much uh, more open mesh, larger features, will that change the topology? Um, the answer is uh, twofold. One, we, we didn't test it, and that's a logical thing to test. We realized not seeing uh, differences between two millimeter and four millimeter, that we really ought to have done something like a 12 millimeter, just like much, much bigger mesh to, to find that, because we would have liked to have seen element scale effects. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you're matching drag coefficients, uh, you know, so if you keep your density constant, um, you know, drag is the dominant term here. So near wake, so Finnegan calls these fine, uh, fine turbulent structures, you know, wake element, uh, vegetative element, individual wakes. Um, Finnegan in uh, Finnegan 2000 cites that as a small feature very, that uh, that is superimposed and gets eaten away by the larger scale features. Um, so near the rows, we might expect to see some difference. Um, I think all else being equal, I don't think you'd see a huge difference in the topology. But if it affected your density and your drag, all bets are off. So. Uh, I think, I think you answered part of this with your answer to our question, but we back one slide with your streamlines. Um, I, the side to side uh, sort of periodicity of the streamlines, I think, kind of makes sense if I, you know, if I squint and, and line up the streamlines so that, you know, it's good to figure out through the lines. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think I know your answer from what Ara said, but what about the flow coming out of the ground? Um, yeah, so these are, so Nate's question is um, looking at the flow features and, you know, flow, you know, near the ground. Um, and, yeah, so we've got you know this this bleed flow coming up and out. Um, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't put too much stock. You know, there's a there is a boundary layer, there's a surface layer underneath that. So we're not violating uh, you know conservation of mass here, um, but that's just the origins. You know, the streamlines and how the streamlines are calculated in the given data set. So what what what's the coloration? On uh, the coloration on this one is uh, vertical velocity. Uh, so norm, normalized by uh, U-start age. So even though the streamlines near the ground are somewhat vertical at times, they obviously the magnitude of them is very, very low. I mean, yeah. with the dark colors on your vertical. Yep. yep. Um, one last question, if I may. Uh, clear back to your first uh, stuff on the PM10 deposition. Uh, you showed three R squared values uh, yeah. near the end, which the atmospheric scientist in me is, is incredibly satisfied with, but the <laughs> engineering in me just weeps at, at how yes. low these numbers are. Uh, wonder if you just speculate on what could be done, uh, perhaps you know the next step off of your present work to try and bring those R squares up for the you know sort of range of length scales and and, and substrates that you were using for this work. Right. Uh, what could you know what could improve on this model? Yeah. So Nate's question is uh, related to the PM10 deposition. Uh, we show model improvement. He he joked that. Atmospheric scientists would be more than satisfied with those correlations. 0. 0.65 is just is stellar in atmospheric science. But the engineers uh, in the room, which is all of us, tend to think uh, we can do better. So what can we do to be better um, in that? Um, I think uh, a couple things. Um, you know, first off, we don't have we don't have a good we don't have any parameterization for instantaneous uh, leaf flutter uh, type effects. You know, leaf Bending and twisting, which would instantaneously and locally change the Stokes number and the characteristic length. So, this, you know, we're assuming averaged um, values for all these parameterizations. When instantaneously and locally, that is not the case. That is only representative of the mean. Um, that could that could definitely uh, affect this. Also, with like leaf relaxation, where your leaf is bending um, in the wind, um, that can uh, that causes you know, what is the length scale of a bent leaf? 
you know, I have no idea. Um, and we'd have to come up with some pretty creative ways to parameterize um, that and then point that to applicability in the field. Because you're not going to have a botanist go and measure, unlike Brian Bailey who did this, go, uh, go measure leaf angles uh, and put strain gauge and accelerometers on leaves. Uh, Brian, if you're watching, you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, your, are your constants in some of equation basically just empirical? They're strictly empirical. Okay, so, I mean, obviously some perhaps expansion on some of the experimental work could, could dial yeah. some of that in as well. Yeah, and like I mentioned, the, that, that non-impaction phase uh, Reynolds number dependent contribution is for a very small Reynolds number. Uh, a span that ran test. Yeah. Uh, so that has no space at all. The Reynolds, uh, the Stokes star parameterization, that seems <laughs> fairly robust uh, if you have an estimate of your Taylor Macro scale. So. Good. So, yeah. Tim. Yes, Walt. So, Walt, um, in relation to this, uh, I noticed that you did your calibration of a dilution series. Mm -hmm. What was the actual retention rate of the fluorescein on the leaves after rinsing? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, uh, did everybody hear what he's asking about? He's asking about the dilution series of the fluorescein quantification. Um, so we did a couple things. Uh, so we, we determined the dilution rate just, you know, in a, in a well plate. Um, and then as far as the uh, leaves go, the, the, the particles were uh, water glycerol particles with uh, with fluorescein uh, doped in them. And the roundabout way to answer your question is we checked for time dependent fluorescein absorption um, in terms of you know how much floor is there fluorescein being absorbed into the into the leaf or into the into the twigs and branches. We found time dependent fluorescein absorption into the twigs, into woody elements. Um, and so we threw away those results because you can't you know, we can't have that. I had to drive up to the hospital to do these tests. Um, but the ones that had no discernible fluorescein time absorption, we uh, we attributed that to uh, total rinsing and washing of the of the vegetative element. Um, uh, and you know, with the chemistry you're using, we're using you know deionized water to rinse off this fluorescein salt and the glycerol uh, combination. There's nothing that should want to stay on a polymer leaf uh, in, in that case. Unless we saw, if we saw time dependent absorption, that would indicate a problem. So I hope that it's kind of a roundabout way to, to answer your question, but we didn't directly say how much might remain on the leaf after washing. Uh, another thing that didn't, didn't mention, so the leaf was put into a, uh, into a tube and sealed and vortex mixed. So this wasn't a bench top rinsing operation, it was a submergent uh, rinsing operation. So hopefully that clarifies it a little bit. Yeah, but I, just biologically, you're gonna have fluorescein adhere to many different types of organic matter. Right. That won't be bad, that will be bound. Okay. So you'll have some loss to the leaf. Great. And that might be some of your errors, what I'm getting yeah. at. Yeah, oh, certainly. And the uh, the noise and the results, I mean, this is a very uh, drawn out experimental procedure with very, very small masses. And so the, the noise in the fluorescent quantification is fairly high. Um, you can see on this plot here, this is standard deviation for an average set of experiments, which not everything was averaged, but the ones that were averaged had considerable noise. So. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's right up there with uh, the forcing adherence and other experimental uh, parameters. So. Yeah. Well, that's probably why your bark has the time dependency is you're going to have a far more abundant microbial population in the bark that's going to uptake the fluorescein. Or some of them will even degrade it if you have enough time. Well, that's really good to know because we I just assumed it was... Uh, just absorbing into the wood, you know, but if there's other processes that do it, that's like a double whammy no-go for yeah. what we did, you know. So, yeah, we threw those, once we saw the time-dependent uh, absorption of fluorescein, said, nope, you're gone, and, and stopped, stopped at the wood. So. so, and then with this, 
also looking at that position, uh, um, how would surface topology on the leaf surface affect adherence? Yeah, that would be that would certainly be a missing parameter um, in the parameterization. The effects of surface roughness. Uh, you know, real leaves have you know microfilaments and all these things that either want to attract or repel real particles, and that hasn't been that hasn't been quantified, um, and really really needs to be um, in, in terms of this work. It may have been quantified elsewhere. I'm just I'm not that familiar with that branch of literature on surface uh, adherence. Well, like on your grass leaf, your surrogate grass isn't going to have the trichomes, so you're not going to have a boundary layer form on the very surface that could cause bouncing of the particles off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, re-emission is a real, uh, yeah, real question on these for sure. Uh, with the you know with the liquid particles, uh, I say qualitatively, we timed the experiments because we could visually see. Uh, you know, if we left that piece of grass in there for 20 minutes, it's going to be dripping, you know, the glycerol uh, mixture off of it. So we were able to qualitatively say, um, you know, when to stop the experiment because we're having good adherence. So whether or not there's there's uh, re-emission, bouncing, all those things would be contained in the in the deposition results that we saw. So. Uh, whether the glycerol water particle is representative of other uh, you know particles in the real world, you know perhaps you know dirt and uh, those would have more tendency to bounce off and re-emit, where a mold, you know a mildew spore would have very different um, surface adherence characteristics, uh, probably more in a line with glycerol. So that would be my guess, but it's it's uneducated at, at that. So. Uh, the last question from our last question. Um, your study. Mm -hmm. So usually that you get like negative smart coefficient, which could be the representation of subculture scale um, stress. So I was just wondering, uh, could you look at the other type of subrisky models and see if they did a better job? Well, so this is um, so Arash is asking about the. Uh, the negative uh, coefficients in the uh, in the filtered fields uh, of the subject scale stresses, uh, and asking if we if there's any models um, that can handle that. So, uh, first off, this is the this is the exact. This is not a model applied. This is filtered and derived out the exact subgroup scale stresses. Um, so this isn't the performance of a model in this case, um, spatially, um, and these are ensemble averaged. So um, going to your question, obviously, uh, just a static Smagorinsky can't even go negative on the Smagorinsky coefficient. So it can't resolve backscatter, period, in a statement. Um, other models can. Uh, one that I personally have experience with is the stochastic backscatter uh, wall models. But those are not appropriate for this, uh, because the stochastic backscatter model um, does just that. It's a statistical representation of a random backscatter in a turbulent boundary layer. Because backscatter will happen, you know. Um, this is spatially identified. There's a spatial region. It's not a stochastic random function. There's an average negative uh, Smagorinsky coefficient uh, in, a, in a confined spatial region. So the short answer to that is I don't know um, if the, you know, if a nonlinear model with some other flavor attached to it can resolve that persistent mean uh, backscatter. So yeah, yeah, perhaps the scale dependent uh, can, but it's it's an effect of the geometry that needs to propagate into the into the resolved field to be accounted for. Because if the resolved field can't see any of that, then you know all bets are off, and you've got to you've got to tweak a knob and and hope for the best at that point. So. All right, so with that, let's close to the session of questions and see how we should go on tomorrow.